Welcome to another Straight Up Tuesday tip. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and co-owner of GC Realty. Mark, we have two more of our friends from Kaiser today. Uh, if, if you have been living in a cave and haven't heard from, uh, haven't heard the podcast in a while, Kaiser is one of our exclusive multifamily sponsors, and we're always looking for different sponsorships. So you know someone out there, even if you're an investor, you have a pool, you have a team of people that can probably benefit from being on the show. So keep that in mind moving forward. So enough with the shameless plug. We're going to talk about condo deconversions again. So if you remember, we had Sean Connolly on here on episode 128, and he talked about the ins and outs of condo deconversions from the developer perspective. Well, today we have Andy Friedman and Jake Parker from Kaiser Group, and they're going to talk about deconversions, but all from the lens of the broker and how it differs from just a, call it, traditional multifamily deal. So Andy and Jake, welcome to the show. I think uh, to kick us off, Give us the 101. What is a condo deconversion? Sure. Uh, very simply, a condo deconversion is a process by which a condominium building uh, with multiple owners gets turned into an apartment building with one owner. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into it. But, you know, the real pertinent part is that ultimately they have to vote on whether or not to do that. Uh, in city limits, that requires 85% of the association members to vote yes. In the rest of the state, it's 75%. Okay. So who initiates that? Like, is, are, is you as a broker, let's talk through like your lens. Are you going and trying, who, who's like running point on this? Jake, you want to take that one? Yeah. So I, it's a mix of us cold calling or reaching out to board presidents, or if there's a bulk owner, we'll reach out to them. And it's also a mix of these associations reaching out to us um, saying, hey, you know, can you give us more information on this topic and, and just, you know, go from there, um, you know, and that ultimately leads to a, giving them a valuation. And, you know, we talk to the whole association, um, but it's, it's a mix of them reaching out to us and us reaching out to them. We even were about to close our first uh, repeat customer. We uh, did a deconversion at 1319 West Sherwin uh, about a year and a half ago. And one of the owners there uh, that owned one unit then called us up five, six months later, told us he owned seven units in an 11 unit building. And would we come look at it? We're closing that one in a couple of weeks. That's awesome. Yeah. So, and then, so you, at what point is, a potential buyer engaged, right? Like you're given some valuation, but are you guys also sitting there saying, Hey, on the other side, we we've thrown some numbers at some people who might have interest. Like this just seems like a lot of moving parts here. It's a lot of moving parts. And, but, but that process is not, you know, we're, we're almost always exclusively engaged by the association with a listing agreement and permission to, to market it. Before that, we valued it. We've had a lot of talks with the association all in one big room or all in a Zoom of, you know, here's what we think you're going to get in a sale. Of course, you're not going to know till you get out there. And, and so by the time we get to a listing, everybody's kind of already educated, knows what to expect. And then we go solicit offers. And I'll piggyback on that. I mean, we've had instances where an association says, just bring us a buyer, bring us an offer. And that ultimately just doesn't do the association and the client justice most of the time. Like Andy said, just when you bring a pool of people, it ultimately drives the market up and gets them the most amount of money for their, their asset. And they usually want the most amount. Of money. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, it, it's kind of funny when I got into real estate in the early 2000s, everything was uh, converting to condos. Um, and this is the total opposite of that. Uh, play the, before the recession, but what you know, this is pretty big right now. It's happening a lot. What, what's gonna What's gonna change in the market or the economy that's going to make these deconversions uh, not relevant anymore? Very simple answer is when a certain building, it, 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 when once the apartments are not worth more than the condos, then it stops. And, and the, the main driver for these and the only reason why they happen is in a given building, and, and we look at these condo buildings all day, and maybe a, a two-bedroom, uh, one-bath unit condo in Andersonville is on the market for 200000 and we know this stuff well enough to know that's probably worth 250000 as an apartment. <clears throat> I, 
when the day comes where there's just not that value spread, these still won't end, but they'll diminish greatly. Got it. Yeah. So the the velocity of this will increase then. So if I'm hearing this correctly, if like call it single family home and condo prices stalemate or you know decline, Stagnate, and multi yes. and multifamily is still hot, then all of a sudden we're going to see a lot more of these come to fruition. They will keep going. And and Mark, as you talked about, you know you were involved in the 2000s. I was not in real estate at the time, but I you know Jake and I have a window every day into the mid 2000s. They, they converted everything. <laughs> Their volume of conversions from apartment to condo that was done was insane. And, and there's literally still a hangover from it. I mean, there's still buildings that are 80% rentals and they can't, you know, because after the crash, people had to move and wound up renting because they couldn't it's like you're still dealing with the aftermath of it. And there's, there's a ton of it still. Yeah, we see all sorts of buildings that were not done at all. They weren't rehab. They were literally taken as an apartment building and pinned out and sold as such. And we see some that were done very, very nice. And, but they just both turned into high amount of rentals, which is crazy. Yeah. What about, uh, one more last question before we wrap here. New construction, is that... The stuff that was, and I say new construction stuff, stuff that was built in that same era. Are you seeing those becoming targets for deconversion? So I think we underwrote that one in Old Town, Jake. It, it almost never pencils out. Okay. And, and I've underwritten a couple of them. It almost never pencils out because that new construction, as we call it, post 2000, those condos hold value. Um, and so it's hard to beat it with apartment value. Now, we are soon to close on a chunk of units in Waukee where it's uh, 76% of the building. I, so it, and that was built in 2006. And then Kaiser Group did one in Arlington Heights, Timber Court that was built in 2006, I think, and, and deconversion, but different circumstances. But Mark, almost always a, the answer is no. Those condos are just worth too much as condos. So um, you kind of threw out uh, what I would call a rule of thumb there for that example in Andersonville. Is that a pretty, like for people listening and wondering if, if my place could be a potential good uh, deconversion, is, is, is there a, a ratio that you, you would share? Is it just... Of how much extra bump in value is there? Yeah, or what, what's the separation? The spread between condo price and price per door as an apartment. Yeah, right. I know it, it, it depends. And you'll always see, you'll see a lot of press of, you know, they, they got 30% more than their units are worth. Well, that might be an average and, and it depends unit by unit. But I mean, we almost always are getting on, on the bottom end, a 20 to 25% premium. We've seen some individual units get a, a huge premium where there was a unit of Barry Quad that sold for 175,000 right before we listed and the owner knew that we were about to do a deconversion. Uh, that owner bought her unit at 175,000 and sold it, went under contract right away to sell for 275,000 in deconversion. Uh, so she made hundred thousand dollars real quick. That that's a very extreme example. Um, it's usually somewhere between 25%, 40%. Maybe if there's uh, maybe you guys have already done this, but maybe if there's a formula of, of my house is worth this much per square foot selling it, but I can rent it per the square foot. If it, if it exceeds this, it makes sense. Like maybe, maybe there's a formula you guys can uh, share someday. I, I think that would ultimately Mark just tie into our underwriting. Gotcha. And uh, you know, it, it, it all I'm trying to get your phone to ring. I'm trying to get people to call you. No. I, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Call us. Call us. I, yes, we have it. Next question. No, right. Right. Jake and I can look at a building real quick. And, and, and have an answer on definitely not going to work, looks perfect, or need a little bit more info. Like we can eyeball something and know pretty quick. Yep. What, one last question before we wrap. I know Mark already said that, but I'm going to say it now too. Uh, what, talk about taxes, right? Because when they're condos, they're separate pins, right? And it's, you know, X amount per unit. And then when you do the deconversion, it's going to be hopefully a lower number, right? It's going to be do you just do it at X percent of the gross rent? Like, how are you projecting that in your underwriting? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a Jake question. Um, yeah. I mean, 
probably two or three, or it was probably three years ago now, it used to be the case where, you know, condo taxes were way higher. You were going to, you know, combine them into one pin and you were going to save on taxes. Since the new assessor has come to town, that's not really the case. Um, I would say we try to pinpoint about 15% of gross income for, you know, a pinpoint, but it, it all depends. I mean, you know, there's sometimes it's beneficial to keep them as condos for a little bit and then combine them. You know, it's sometimes if they're super high as condos, it's, it's better to deconvert and combine at one point. But it's, it's a case by case basis, but I'd say 15% is where we try to pinpoint on where it should be. And, and most of our underwriting these days, it comes out as somewhat of a wash of the condo taxes are 100,000 and we pro forma 103,000 or 95,000 as the apartments. Ultimately, somebody, you know, be cumbersome to pay 100 different tax bills for one building. So at some point, everybody's going to want to deconvert it into one pin. But it used to be a good tax arbitrage and our friend Fritz took that away. <laughs> Our friend, use loosely on this show. <laughs> Our friend. <laughs> All right, awesome. Guys, ton of great intel here. Uh, Mark, are you ready for your Chicago fact? I am ready. All right, we'll give Mark a shot at this. Then uh, Jake and Andy will also give you, you a chance to chime in. So, Mark, I don't know if you knew this, but in Chicago, during Prohibition, if the door on a building was painted this color, it indicated that the establishment was a speakeasy. Now, I'm not going to give you multiple choice, but I will give you a clue. There is a pretty historic bar located on Orleans Street that bears the name of the correct answer. So what is the color of that door? It was green. There you go. The Green Door Tavern was the clue. Did you, did you know that green was the answer without that clue? No, I knew Green Door Tavern. Because um, I think I said this before. At one point, we uh, were looking to identify ourselves in the buildings we were buying on the South side and like having a specific door, if you knew it's GC door, because it's a couple of colors. <laughs> and I saw that and yeah, it all kind of ties together, but I honestly I did not know I had to do a prohibition. So that was just a uh, lucky, lucky, lucky here. So I guess. Nice. Now our, our listeners don't know this, but we recorded two episodes today. It's Friday. Everyone's feeling good. And Mark got both Chicago questions, right? So we, he's going into a solid weekend here. Right. So what I'm thinking, what we have to do is we have to have uh, somebody um, we could, we could tie this together with if somebody buys a shirt, one of the people that buys a shirt or sweatshirt on the merch store, they get put into raffle where if I get the question right, they get like a hundred dollars or something like that. Like we, we got to do something fun like that. Like where we have a uh, You're gonna disappoint a lot of people, those wrong answers though. How, how great <laughs> we'll, we'll have to give them a participation prize. I already thought. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jake, Andy, thank you very much for coming on here. It was an awesome show. Tom, thank you as always. Listeners, we are, me and Tom are considering doing a rooftop party at Wrigley Field this summer. So if anyone's interested and thinks that's a good idea, we should do it. Jump onto our Facebook group and let us know you think we should have that party. I figure we could have a straight up Chicago uh, uh, rooftop party. So I'm in. I'm in. All right, Andy, Jake, we got two people in. Everyone else, go on Facebook. Give us, uh, we want to get uh, 40 or 50 people knowing that they'd be interested. So we actually will go through the effort of setting up. I know it'll be a fun time, but there's a... Uh, or if anyone likes the party plan, you can help us out. So yeah, uh, if anyone wants to there. plan this for us, just please raise your hand. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not in on that. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Andy, Jake, and I and Tom, we need a party planner. So anyone that's interested in helping us there, that'd be awesome too. So uh, guys, thank you again. Tom, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you guys. We'll see you uh, Thursday. See you guys. Okay. Yeah.